Well, did you know an old pre preacher was dying? And he sent a message for his banker and his lawyer, both church members, to come to his home. When they arrived, they were ushered up to his bedroom. As they entered the room, the preacher held out his hands and motioned them to sit on each side of the bed. The preacher grasped their hands, sighed contentedly, smiled, and stared at the ceiling. For a time, no one was said anything, but the banker and the lawyer were touched and flattered that the preacher would ask them to be with him during his final moments. They were also puzzled. The preacher had never given them any indication that he particularly liked them. They both remembered his many long, uncomfortable sermons about greed, covetousness, and other behaviors that made them squirm in their seats. Finally, the banker said, Preacher, why did you ask us to come? The old preacher mustered up his strength, and then he said weakly, Jesus died between two thieves, and that's how I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like imitating from Jesus to the end. Boy, that's pretty bad, isn't it? You know, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight. We just thank you, God, for... Uh, the body of Christ, especially here at Church on the Street. And Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for each member. And we thank you, Lord, that you have great things in store for us. Teach us tonight, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Suppose there are about 40 or 50 different men around the world. They don't know each other. They've never seen each other or talked to each other. And they all came in with a little piece of a ceramic and it just so happened when they came into the room they were able to fit every little piece together and it formed a beautiful mosaic wow you figure how could that ever happen how could that ever transpire and right away we would say yeah there was a master planner who knew exactly how many pieces and what niche go where and so forth well, that's what this is right here. This Bible was written by over 40 different men, inspired by God. In many different languages, from never many different places. And yet, God has brought it all together, right here, old and new, has brought it all together with a very meaningful reason for it. And the undergirding reason uh, for the Word of God, my friend, is the Kingdom of God. A place where God rules. He ruled in the beginning. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happened there. When Jesus came on the scene, what did he say? Behold, the Kingdom of God is here. John the Baptist said that, and Jesus himself said, I've come to preach the kingdom of God. He talked about the kingdom of God. And the Sermon on the Mount, he prayed, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When he ascended into heaven and was received all power and authority over everything, he told his disciples to what? Preach the kingdom, extend the kingdom. And then in the book, what did it say in Revelation? The kingdom of God is of Christ. And he shall reign what? Forever and ever and ever. And the original kingdom of God is restored. That's the name. That's the story of the book. So as we look at, for, at creation in our first couple of chapters, we realize that God had some fantastic plans, did he? Beautiful, beautiful creation. And then, of course, he made man. And... He made man in his image, which meant that he was not like the animals, that he was something, someone who could think, who could reason, he had a will, he had emotions, personality, he had knowledge, he had righteousness, and he had holiness. And he and God were like this. And then the Lord said, it took Adam and Eve and said, you know what, I want you to be co-regents, which means I want you to govern, take charge of my land. Gave him that authority. 
And then, of course, we're looking at three through five tonight, and we won't go into too much detail in three, but most of you guys know what happens in chapter three. The beginning of chapter three is almost like the first two chapters. It's just beautiful and wonderful, and how many know? Uh, every once in a while, the other foot comes down, right? And the beginning of chapter 3, it just, you could almost sense something's going to go wrong. It just says, now the serpent was the most cunning. And we know the story. Jesus said, you could eat of anything in the garden, but there's one tree I want you to refrain from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan comes along and says, did he really say that? Huh? Yeah, it looked pretty good. Uh, and I love what our brother I was talking about. We know what sin is like. The temptation. And push comes to shove. You know, they went ahead and they violated God's command. And when that happened, basically what they set them in was they really were sucked into was the idea that now they could decide what's good and evil. They're going to be their own rulers and call the shots. And of course, along with that came a division between man and woman, fighting and questioning, doubting everybody, and relationship between God and man was separated. And it was just another downward, a downward um, uh, spiral. And in their challenge, they were challenging God and his right to rule. In Romans chapter 1, 21, Paul said, describing man, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. They never honored God, they never glorified him, and they never thanked him. And that's the epitome of the result of the fall. But you know, listen to this. In our day and age, 2024, this is what the cultural secularists mean. The guy that's in the world that doesn't, you know, the world. This is what he says. God didn't create man. People created God in their own image. And then they went, they go on to say, and he created a male and female? Oh, no one has an innate gender. Knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, those are just a bunch of masks to exert power over other creatures, to tell you what to do. That is the mentality of the person who doesn't know God today. And that's exactly the way it was in the beginning after the fall. And the book now, especially the chapters we're talking about now, we are going to see what happens as a result of the fall. The rise of this mindset of the world that is so prevalent even today, and also the rise of God's promise, and how he is going to carry it like a red thread throughout the Bible. Because we know, although there was the fall, we know in Genesis 3, 15, when, G when God was speaking to the enemy, Satan, he said to them, he said to him, and I will put enmity, that means hatred, between you and the woman, between your seed, your ancestors, your people that come after you, and her, and his seed. He, now notice the he, it means singular. God is saying somebody from you, you your seed, shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his head. Some translations will even use the term, he shall what? Crush your head, and, and you shall bruise his heel. That's the first promise that God has for an answer to the problem that we have in the world today. 
that the seed, which is Jesus Christ, would be able to crush the head of the evil one as the evil one would bruise his heel when we know the cross of Jesus Christ. Although the enemy thought it was a crushing blow, we know that God had another story. That he was raised from the dead and he was able to reign and reestablish that kingdom. Reestablish that kingdom within your heart. Reestablish that kingdom as we spread it around. Reestablish it and give the guarantee that there is an end to the book and we win and we have a new heaven and earth compared to where it was before. Amen? Amen. So it goes on in chapter 4 after Adam and Eve. It says, Now Adam knew Eve, and Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, the word Cain means kind of like, um, kind of like, uh, uh, I've, I've, I've gotten it. It's an, in other words, I think Eve thought, oh, I got a man. This must be the answer. Okay? And I think that's why he was called um, gotten or acquired. And this is our answer. There's the seed. You know, isn't that true? We expect God to do what we want him to do like that. How many know it's going to take many, 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 many thousand years between this and the time the seed comes? Amen? Amen. In the fullness of time, God's going to do what he's going to do in our lives as well as the lives of his people and the world. Amen? Amen. So here comes Cain, and he thought, boy, this must be the answer. And then she bore another son named Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd. And Cain, of course, was a gardener. He was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of his fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and countenance fell. There's all kinds of reasons why people say that God did not accept Cain's offering. Notice it said, and Abel brought the first, uh, the first animal, the first uh, born of his livestock. And I think, I think Cain brought the first, first. Uh, a crop that he had. But I think the book of Hebrews gives us a little hint. Because in the Hebrews it says, by faith, by faith, Abel offered up a sacrifice that was pleasing to God, by faith. You see what happens is, it's not so much what you offer God, but how you offer it. Amen. Keep that in mind. It's how you offer it. Yeah, I'm throwing the bucket in. Do you really give it in faith? And this is what the problem was. But notice now, the Bible is going to continue to develop the character of God. The more you understand who God is and what he's like, the more likable he is. And look what he does. He could have just said, man, you're out of here, Cain, but look what he did. In verse 6, so the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. You should rule over it. God was so merciful. He loved Cain. He said, okay, Cain, let's make it right. How could just 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 admit what you did wrong and let's try it one more time. Let's do it right. But he had so much anger and bitterness in his heart. It was like he's saying to God, talk to my hand. Amen? Amen. And so then we see what happens. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and so forth? Um, verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. 
Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries to me out from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond bond you shall be. And Cain said to the Lord, Wouldn't you want, wouldn't you love to have heard him say, Oh God, forgive me? But look what he says. He said, Oh, he said, he says, your consequences are too hard on me. He says, um, um, surely you have mercy. And my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me up this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. You hear him say, let me tell you something, you guys. Consequences will never turn someone's heart to God. Consequences don't do it. You know how many people have hit rock bottom and they get consequences of it and why do they just get themselves together, spend a few days in rehab and they're not doing the same thing. Consequences won't do it. It's got to be God moving upon their hearts. And his heart was resolved and we see it. And, and, uh, and so... There were, at this time, my friends, listen carefully, there were many other children that were born to Adam and Eve. The purpose of the Bible is not a very careful historical chap verse, uh, verse after verse of generation after generation. No, no, no. The message here is, let me tell you what happened. It all started in the garden. And then look what Cain did. Look to the extent that he did it. Now what's going to happen to Cain and his line? And right away the Bible will proceed and talk about Cain because he wants to show you. What is he showing you? He's showing you the origin of the world that we live in today that Iowa was talking about. The mindset of the world, whether it's 1620, whether it's 2024, whether it was that time, it is still operated by the same evil one, yeah. the same desires, and the same of uh, 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 drives of pride yeah. and 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 lust and so forth. And so, if you take a look at this, and I'm sure I'm missing something really good, but I guess I'm on a roll. But it's going to be the history of that of that kingdom. I know that in um, in First John three twelve, it's he, uh, John says, "Do not be like Cain, who belongs to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him?" This is NIV because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Whoa! You know, when you are good and you're next to somebody that's helping to be in the world, they don't like you. Dark does not like light. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then you take a look at the line of Cain now as it develops. Listen carefully. You can get lost in all these different names, but let me just show you what's going to happen as a result of how this sin is going to get, it's going to take over and it's going to create an environment, a world that is just worse than the generation before. Look at verse 17 in chapter 4. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. E-N-O-C-H. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son. And so now we're going to see, remember, Cain is away from the presence of God. East of Eden. Away from the presence of God. And now he is going to pursue just the opposite of what God wants. We were created for his glory, but now we're going to see Cain and his descendants create things for his glory, man's glory, my, man's pride. And that's exactly what happens. And all of a sudden now through this line, you see a development of the culture of the different arts. You see them 
trying to reestablish the earth and center it on them, make a name for themselves, and settle and, in, and enjoy this earth that they're going to define. This is their kingdom of the world. Here's the kingdom of God, and now they are creating a kingdom of their world. Look down in the same uh, line from Cain. You've got Enoch. Slip, slip down and see the name uh, in chapter 19. The Lamech took for himself. Lamech is a descendant of, es of Enosh, and, or Enoch, you want to pronounce that. And what do we hear about Lamech? Well, look at verses 23. Uh, He's bragging. Listen to what he says. Says to his wife, Listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting, hurting me. But Cain should be avenged. If Cain is, should be avenged sevenfold, in other words, if he gets consequences, let me tell you something. I deserve 70 times sevenfold. In other words, what he's saying, he's saying, I'm going to show you God. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's an increase of violence. There's an increase of pride. There's an increase of materialism that you see that's creating in this world. In this world. And the purpose is, is to show you that that was the line of, of Cain. And it's interesting because a secularist today was asked this question. What is your only comfort in life and death? This is what was said. My comfort? That I am my own. That because of my autonomy, in other words, I'm in charge of my life, I don't need anyone else. There are no absolutes for me to offend against. And death is oblivion. So I don't need to fear any kind of judgment. This started in the mind of Cain and Enoch and Lamech, and it got worse. And there's nothing new under the sun. Because of man's choice and the fall, the Bible is showing you this is what happened. Now, he's through talking about that. He's letting you know that there was a line, a genealogy from Cain that was very bad, that got worse, and literally became what we would see the modern humanist, the modern secularist. So now he's going to say, you know what? But there is another side of the story. Look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him what? Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. <sighs> another breath of fresh air, she's thinking. Okay? And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. You see the difference. You have this worldly line, the line of the kingdom of this world, starting with the fall of Adam to Cain, and then to Enoch, and to Lamech, and it just gets worse. But now we have Seth. Another line, another genealogy that's coming through. Remember the promise in the garden. Obviously, that is not going to be fulfilled through this downward spiral. But God says, I keep my promises. And here's Seth. So Seth comes on the scene. And now things are looking And we take a look down on, on chapter 6, and verse 6, and we see that Seth lived the old, and he had a son was Enosh. And, and actually, um, some refer to it as Enoch. If you take a look at Enoch, no, that's Enosh, and I'm just jumping down the genealogy just to show you. Seth, and then he had Enosh, and we know that they're calling upon the name of the Lord. It's a godly line. They're not perfect, but they're godly. 
and you see it jump down. Look at verse 18. There was born a man by the name of Enoch in this godly line. And Enoch begat Methuselah in verse 21. But then it says here about Enoch in verse 22. Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. What a contrast. It's unbelievable. There was an Enoch born in this line who was terrible. City named after him, full of pride, produced worse people. And now you have an Enoch on this side from Seth, and he was so close to God that what? He didn't die. The Hebrew writer says, and by faith, Enoch uh, did not face God, face death. He, he, went, he couldn't be found. Why? Because God had taken him. Why? Because it was said that he pleased God. Amen. And we know without faith, it's impossible to please him. For God is a rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek him. And that's what Enoch did. How refreshing to know that there is a kingdom of God that is being birthed even here in Genesis and it's through this line that we know that that promise that was given at John in three, Genesis 3.15 is going to come through. And that, I think that's exciting. And so it goes on from there. Okay, now let's take a look. Now, Enoch is the one that was destined, um, Seth's line was destined to carry out the promise of restoring the kingdom of heaven. And if you check down there, Enoch, notice, look at 28. In that line from Methuselah, Enoch and Methuselah, is the word what? Lamech. Both lines had an Enoch, and both lines had a Lamech. But what do we know about this Lamech? Well, he happened to be the father of who? Noah. Noah. See that godly trend there? You've got Enoch, and you've got Enoch. You've got Lamech, and you've got Lamech. So you see that godly line is developing there. There's hope. God keeps his promises. Isn't that exciting? From the very beginning, and you see his compassion. You see his love. Even with Cain, how he bent over backwards to try to help him make a better decision. Through Seth, now we see that godly line. Now, if we take a jump start into the next chapter, which is not my assignment, you're going to see some unfortunate things happen. Because how many know that when you have godly people living in a godless world, it's just a matter of time when that girl winks at that guy, and before you know it, they're going together, and you get pollution. And that's exactly what happened. The sons of God, which represents that beautiful, holy line of Seth, started to make and, and intermarried with the ungodly people from Cain, and the whole race was a mess. And we know what God said. I have a remnant. His name is Noah. He's come from a line that walked with God. He's my man. His family. It's through him I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to restore my kingdom. Judgment is coming. 
and judgment came in the form of the flood. But God, Noah, you go to the New Testament, Jesus Christ came from the line of Seth. This Bible is real. Yes, it is. What are the odds of all of this coming together? And if you know Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you, and He bears witness to this, that this is true. You are living in a world that is becoming more and more like the Canaanites, the line of Cain, more and more. I told you last week, I couldn't find a postage stamp for Christmas that had the Madonna and Child on it. All secular. Mm -hmm. Little things. Don't you remember the times you could go shopping and you'd hear Heart the Herald Angels sing or something in the store? Oh, no more. It's, you know, somebody got run over by the grandma got run over by the reindeer or some stupid thing. You know what I'm saying? And let me tell you something. I rose right on. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And you see how strong it is. But my friends, the gates of hell are not going to prevail. The kingdom of God, the line of Seth, is successful. And Christ came, and now that kingdom is within us. And we are extending it. It's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom of, of loving God and loving others. Amen? So we'll be excited to see what's going to happen. We know the next thing is, after Noah, is he's going to pick a man. His name was Abraham, but that's another story. Father, we thank you so much for your word of God. Wow, what a miracle. What a miracle. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. God, you glorify yourself when we allow you to. So keep us humble, keep us open, and give us hearts that just hunger to learn more about really knowing you like Adam knew Eve. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.